Well, it's cold and flu season, and a lot of people at the office have gotten both the flu or the cold, and a lot of friends and relatives, so I know it's really going around. And some of you might know I own a medical billing company, and one of our clients is family practice, and I am amazed at how many people call her and beg for antibiotic for just a cold. And you know, people come into the office and will hear a complaint, well, all she did was tell me I need to get some rest and drink plenty of fluids. Yeah, you got a cold. They're upset because maybe they had to pay $80 and they didn't get a prescription. And that kind of mentality is really worrisome. People think antibiotics are used for everything and a big, big cure-all. And you know what? That's not always the case. In fact, overuse and other things can cause something called superbugs, and that could be the end of civilization. Okay, maybe not the end of civilization, but superbugs are very, very scary, and they are a real thing. So today I want to tell you what antibiotic resistance is, the dangers of it, how it developed, and what you can do to prevent it. So antibiotics are used to combat bacterial infections. And what can happen over time, the bacteria can become antibiotic resistant. And that is very dangerous because an infection can happen and there ends up to be no antibiotic you can use to kill that infection and the patient can die. So I wanna be very clear. It is the bacteria that becomes resistance to the antibiotic, not the human host, not us. So you could be doing everything right in your life and you still could get a bacterial infection that is resistant to antibiotics even though you have never used an antibiotic in your life. According to the CDC, in the United States, at least two million people a year get an infection that is resistant to antibiotics. And of those 2 million, 23,000 die. And it's projected worldwide that by 2050, those dying from resistant antibiotic type infections will equal or surpass those dying from cancer and diabetes. Now that is a humongous number. And we're seeing a growing number of resistant antibiotic bacterial infections in pneumonia, TB, gonorrhea, and salmonella. So what got me interested in the superbug was I'd read an article in a recent medical journal and it was entitled, A New Superbug on the Horizon. And you know, that's never a good thing. Anyway, it said a new emerged superbug had been discovered uh, and it was a final outbreak of ST11. And what's happened is patients in a Chinese hospital had gotten pneumonia, they were on ventilators, but otherwise they were relatively healthy. And usually a certain antibiotic could kill that strain of pneumonia. But this was a new strain and it was resistant to the only antibiotic that could kill it. All five patients died. So very, very serious and who knows? Something like that could spread. So I'm going to put up a little slide here. Our CDC thinks the number one hazard is C. diff. And you know, I have personal experience with that. My brother died last summer from that. If you'd like to learn more, I'll have a video link up here and it will teach you a little bit about what C. diff is. So how do bacteria infections become resistant to antibiotics? Well, there's a natural process over time. There are genetic changes, but they have been accelerated by some other factors, such as overusing antibiotics in our livestock, overprescribing antibiotics to patients. Well, here, let me put up this slide. It explains more. So you can see the causes of antibiotic resistance Yep, are overprescribing, 
and then patients not finishing their full 12 days or whatever it is of their antibiotic, that can cause problems. Overuse of antibiotics in livestock and fish farming, and of course, poor infection control in hospitals and clinics, any medical setting, lack of proper hygiene, and unfortunately, really no new antibiotics are being discovered. So we're using antibiotics that are 70 years old. Now let me explain a little bit what happens for livestock. About 70% of the antibiotics used in the U.S. are used for raising livestock. But most of those animals aren't sick. In fact, most veterinary antibiotics go to animals to encourage faster growth or prevent illness because they're living in such crowded conditions. Now, interesting enough, in the livestock, okay, we all know the antibiotics is in their feed, right? Um, and some of them are actually vaccinated but it also is in their manure, what comes out. And that manure can then be used to fertilize vegetables. So it can get into the crops that way. And it always, um, the bacteria always exists in the soil, air, water, it is around us. So I wanna show you a slide in a minute here on a study that was done in 2013. Um, they were testing meat bought in the supermarket. Look at this. 81% uh, of ground turkey had antibiotic resistant bacteria on it, 69% of pork chops, 55% of ground beef, and 39% of chicken breasts, wings, and thighs. You know, I would have thought number one was ground beef and I would have been wrong. So I wanna read to you just a little summary of another article. It's entitled Last Resort Antibiotic threatened by overuse in livestock. And it's talking about an E. coli bacterium taken from a sample taken from a Pennsylvania woman. She was suffering from a urinary tract infection. And it turned out it was resistant to colistin. And that is what we have considered our antibiotic of last resort for this type of UTI. First time this was in the United States, this was May of last year. So now we know it is in the US and it will spread. It was only until very recently that we had any bacterial strain that was resistant to colistin, but this drug is used in China and European livestock production. So we were lucky until very recent, we didn't have that strain that was resistant to the colostrum. Um, but in China and Europe, they use that antibiotic for livestock. You know, if it is so, so important for being a antibiotic of last resort, the question has to be, why is it being used in livestock? So the next thing to talk about is overuse. And I talked about it a little bit. I mean, a lot of times um, patients uh, demand more antibiotics because they think it is the cure-all. They haven't even tested to know if they have a bacterial or a viral infection. And you know, you all as preppers, if you are storing fish antibiotics, have to be very, very careful. Um, if you're administrating them to yourself or family members without proper testing, um, you could also be leading to the problem. In some foreign countries, in fact, many foreign countries, you do not need a prescription. So people just buy the antibiotic because they think they have something and they're hoping that the antibiotic will help. So this causes even more of a problem worldwide. Now let's look at this map. It shows uh, the US antibiotic prescription rates. So you can kind of see how your state is doing. Well, at least Michigan wasn't the worst. Now many people get confused about a bacterial infection and a viral infection. So I wanna put this chart here for when do you do or when do you not need an antibiotic? Bronchitis? You know, I remember getting bronchitis before in the office and somebody saying, well, why aren't you going to the doctor and getting something? I said, well, antibiotics don't help anyway. This is just something I'll cough through. <laughs> the same is true for the common cold and runny nose and sinus infection. You know, in most cases, it's gonna take care of itself. You, there's no need for an antibiotic because it is usually a viral infection. And you know, one of the things that people sometimes get confused with, in the past they were given the antibiotic inappropriately and they took it and they got better even though they just had a cold. 
Well, the reason is that generally you go to the doctor when you're feeling your worst, and then you have 24 hours to take the antibiotic, and then they tell you you'll feel better. Well, the honest truth is if you would have done nothing, you probably would have felt better in 24 hours. But in your mind, you've linked the two and think the antibiotic was your savior. So ear infections are usually not bacterial. Flu, we all know is a virus. Sore throats don't need an antibiotic. Now, exception is if you have strep, but you have to be tested. And if it's determined that you have strep, then yes, you will probably be given an antibiotic. And for UTIs, you know, urinary tract infections, very often an antibiotic is necessary. But again, it should be determined what antibiotic after you've been tested to affirm that you do indeed have an infection. And the one thing is you don't want to take an antibiotic unless you have to because it kills off all the good gut bacteria and it can make other problems with your immune system and everything else we're finding our gut bacteria do a lot of things in regulating in our body that we never knew before so you're killing off good and bad bacteria and you don't want the bad bacteria to grow before the good bacteria in your gut it can cause problems if you think about it many people get yeast infections after taking antibiotic and that's the reason why okay so now you know that infections resistant to antibiotics, the superbugs, are a very real danger. So what can you do to prevent it? Well, number one, only use antibiotics appropriately and follow your doctor's instructions of use. You know, take them for the amount of time you're told to take them. Do never take antibiotics unnecessarily. Number two, be good stewards. Um, try to as much as possible buy your meat and your veggies and maybe some of your fruit from local farmers who use good organic practices and lot their animals to roam not free but in a bigger area not in those little confined cages where a lot of times bacteria spreads three which really probably should be number one because it's very very important wash your hands often with water and not antibacterial soap. Because one of the problems that our environment has been using anterior bacterial soap, um, hand sanitizers and that, has also accelerated the problem with resistant antibiotic infections. Avoid using antibacterial household products such as soap and cleaning materials. Don't do it. And then consider adding Manuka honey and colloidal silver I'm saying that uh, cream to your first aid the manuka honey has been shown to be effective on infections uh, even the MRSA MRSA which is fantastic it has helped and of course the silver is helpful for a lot of different infections so add both of those to your first aid preps and it's important to feed your immune system and what do I mean by that well, get proper uh, rest, you know, seven to eight hours a night. Actually feed your body the right type of foods. Uh, plenty of good vegetables and fruit. And make sure your vitamin D levels are optimum because that vitamin D is important for fueling your immune system. And try to have a positive outlook on life. All of those things helps your immune system. Well, I hope they're wrong about the future superbugs, but it does seem to be happening. So we all have to be on guard and do our best to help out to not accelerate the resistant antibiotic bacteria in our environment. So this is Prepper Potpourri saying, next time your doctor says, uh, no, an antibiotic won't help you, say, thank you, doctor pay your visit fee, and realize that antibiotics are not the cure-all. Love to hear from you if you've had any experience with superbugs uh, for yourself or your family, and if you have any more information on the subject. As always, share the knowledge, and thank you so, so much for your support.